from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what we're working on for you this weekend. Tax reform entered the final stages this week, but those tax changes aren't permanent. If we get a change in the White House, a change in Congress, it may not even last 10 years. Farm CPA Paul Neifer says there are steps you can take now. It's an all-women roundtable from Executive Women in Agriculture. Can corn find enough news to rally in the new year? It's not going to be a big rally when it happens unless there's two events that happen at the same time. I'm Betsy Jibben. Florida citrus growers are taking a hit due to citrus greening. We talk with California producers about what they're doing to prevent it. That's our Farm Journal report and a historic event with a tragic ending commemorated in a popular song. We travel with Andrew McRae. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Now for the news, after earlier rumblings that the Environmental Protection Agency may slash ethanol volume requirements, EPA says it's honoring Congress's commitment to supporting American-made ethanol. EPA holding the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, steady for 2018. The RFS is now set at 19.29 billion gallons of renewable fuels into the gasoline and diesel supply in 2018. Now the breakdown is 15 billion gallons of conventional corn-based ethanol, 4.29 of advanced biofuels and 2.1 of biodiesel. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt saying, quote, maintaining the renewable fuel standard at current levels ensures stability in the marketplace and follows through with my commitment to meet the statutory deadlines and lead the agency by upholding the rule of law, end quote. Now, groups like the National Chicken Council saying corn ethanol of all blends has saturated the domestic market in the industry as ethanol continues to be produced at a faster pace than consumption can grow. And the American Soybean Association says it's frustrated by the lack of growth for biodiesel. Well, USDA releasing some long term projections looking at next season. USDA expecting corn and soybean acres to be equal at 91 million acres apiece. Wheat plantings are expected to fall by another million acres down to 45 million. As some farmers are busy making fall nitrogen applications, University of Illinois' Gary Schnitke says nitrogen fertilizer prices have hit a 10 year low. Farmers can expect roughly $400 per ton for anhydrous ammonia. That's down considerably from last year's more than $500 per ton. He attributes the decrease to new anhydrous ammonia plants coming online and fewer U.S. corn acres. Well, dryness continues to intensify across the majority of the U.S. this week. In the south, the area considered abnormally dry is now consuming 72% of the area, an 11-point jump from last week. An extreme drought showing up in Arkansas for the first time with a large pocket covering nearly 15% of the state. Now moderate drought also expanded in Kansas now at 15%. That's up 14 points from last week. Agriculture's national forecast is brought to you by Elevo seed treatment from Bayer. All right, those were the headlines. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman joins us now with weather. Mike, there are rumblings of a major cold front heading our way, but how widespread will that be? Tyne, there's no doubt about it. Uh, by next weekend, everybody east of the Rockies will at least have seen a taste of winter and some areas just a blast of winter. But let's go through the drought monitor first. We're seeing our first area of extreme drought southwestern Arkansas. This whole area is expanded. Let's go back a month and you can see it wasn't looking nearly as bad, but we were saying we have to watch that area. As we've gone through the last month, you've just seen that area expand uh, pretty rapidly and it has uh, dried up a little bit more in parts of the southeast. It stayed dry western South Dakota into northeastern Montana. All right, let's go day by day. This is the start of the cold air into the northern plains on Monday. So a little bit of snow on the back edge of the storm system. Otherwise, it showers throughout the Mississippi Valley and the Great Lakes. By Wednesday, that first cold front is all the way down to Tampa and Orlando, and this is very cold air for this time of the year coming all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. Little systems kind of diving through the upper level flow will uh, produce a little bit of snow, but most of these are going to be so weak they won't be anything significant. Lake effect areas, though, will have to watch, especially by Friday when the really frigid air starts to come in. Secondary cold front kind of coming southward as well. It'll be cold all the way to the Gulf Coast by next Friday, but you'll notice warm and dry conditions continue out west, uh, west of that stationary front. So it's basically east of the continental divide. We're going to feel the cold this week. We'll have your longer range forecast coming up on our next half hour. 
Thanks, Mike. When we come back, we're off to the Executive Women in Agriculture Conference in Chicago. It's an all-women marketing discussion. Naomi Bloom, Julian Johnston, and Angie Setzer join me next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this week. As I mentioned before the break, we're here from the Executive Women in Agriculture, and always a, a, a great conference with like-minded women in the room, a great turnout this week, and we're excited for this panel. We have Naomi Bloom, Julianne Johnston, and Angie Setzer. Angie, we'll, we'll start with you. A lot of these women in the room have, have the same issue that we've been talking about on the show for, for a few months. Corn in the bin, we don't know what to do at this point. You know, what is your advice uh, as we set here and, and going into the beginning of December? My biggest advice is if you're paying for commercial storage, know what you're trying to get out of it. The fact remains if you have corn on basis, uh, you're looking at taking a roll or you did take a roll this past week that cost you about 13 or 14 cents. And the biggest thing that you don't wanna see happen is the March board fall back to where the December board is traded. So be aware of what you're trying to accomplish if you are kicking basis contracts down the road. If you're paying commercial storage, know what you're looking to, to try to accomplish out of that too. And be aware that any sort of real market move may be several months away. And that could be a lot of money in storage that could basically eat up any sort of gains that we would see. So my number one thing that I can say about, about anything out there is if you are holding on to grain, you need to know what you're trying to accomplish. Write it down today when things seem a little bit dire. So that way when it happens, you know that those are the opportunities that you want to take. And you need to be realistic about what opportunities you're looking for as well. But Naomi, I keep hearing from analysts who say, carry is your friend, the carry is your friend. Use that to your advantage. Do, do you agree with that? Uh, there's a few different ways you can work with the carry. So one would be using your cash market and going out and doing a hedge to arrive out to next December because you're still in the 380 to 390 level and you're getting a start on your cash sales. Um, another way you can work to sell the carry, uh, if you have a higher risk tolerance, would be to sell call options out to the deferred contracts, and you can capture some premium that way. It is not for everyone by any means. It is a risky position of a potential margin call if the market rallies. Do what you can do in the cash market first. Uh, Angie's point is very valid, though, about understanding what you're paying for storage. It might be opportunistic to sell and reown with an option strategy, but then make sure you know what your rate of return is on that call option to make sure that's worth what your while as well. But Julian, what is the potential that we will rally? I mean, you mentioned that. I mean, you could, you could lose out if that happens. But really, where we set today, what's the potential that that really happens? Well, it's not going to be a big rally when it happens unless there's two events that happen at the same time because we could, between now and the end of the year, see some funds short covering. Funds hold a near record net short position in this corn market, but funds are also near record large net short in wheat as well. So if we decide we want to lighten that load, we could see some short covering. Um, funds are defending their long position in the soybean market, and that's helped keep the soybean market up a little bit. But for the corn market, um, the demand is well known. We, we aren't getting a demand surprise. We really need a demand surprise. And that would help to support this market, but it won't provide a large rally at this time. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that's important about pointing out about the fund short, which it, it, you could see a, that generator rally, or at least that tells us that, you know, perhaps they're running out of ammunition to sell. Uh, the reality is, though, is that if you hold a short position with the carry in the market that everyone loves to talk about, it benefits you. If you're short the market, you get, you have to buy the Ds and sell the March, mm -hmm. and then you sell buy the March and sell the, the May. And so to have a short position, you know, prior to the pre-ethanol, you know, pre-ethanol, during that time period, you could maintain a, a constant short in the market. And a lot of times you saw that that short in the market remain because of the fact that it really was beneficial to the funds to just kind of continue to kick that position down the road. Well, seeing that the next contract, when the December contract goes off, we're seeing March come down to where December was trading. Yeah. So that's why it's important to take advantage of the carry in the market because with large supplies and large global supplies, the market just has a tendency to deflate as that next contract comes on board. Julian mentioned though, we need a demand surprise. Angie mentioned ethanol. We've been hearing some, some, some um, things about China and, and increasing the mandate there, but some analysts think we're not going to see that maybe until 2019 because that mandate is in place 2020. Do you think that that happens sooner? I think we're starting to see it happen sooner because China is buying corn this week. China is importing ethanol. 
And they're at 20% um, capacity for what they have for fuel that is going into ethanol. And if they want to get the rest of that corn ethanol into the fuel, it's going to take an additional billion bushels of corn every year to make that happen. And we are seeing China. China imported 11 cubic uh, meters of uh, 11,000. Yeah. yeah <clears throat> and the other thing, too, besides China, is that Japan now is importing yeah. our ethanol. And that was a big deal because they've only been buying Brazilian uh, the sugar ethanol. Right. And so now they're going to say, U.S., you're part of it too. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we need to take a quick break. But when we come back, there's also some talk about China with cheese and lowering the tariffs there. So what possibly that could mean to dairy prices. We'll do that when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. Receive a free trial of the Daily Grain Plan newsletter from Roach Ag Marketing. Text ROACH to 31313. Start your subscription today by texting ROACH to 31313. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report again here from EWA. Before we move over to livestock, let's talk wheat. Uh, not really some exciting things to talk about wheat lately, but you're kind of bullish moving forward, Angela? Yeah, I am. I think I'm the only person in the world that is right now, um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, we were talking about China going into the break and, and what they've got going on with corn, which is, is true. We're seeing um, their corn ending stocks are, are down almost a billion bushel this year, so they're starting to chew through that. The fact remains that China right now is sitting on 48% of the world's wheat stocks. 48%, that's almost half, right? And uh, none of that is going to make it into the global pipeline. So we're really just one production hiccup away. We started to see some issues develop with Australia. We've got the La Nina weather pattern that's in place. Maybe it's mild, but it's still there. Um, Southern Plains have been a little bit drier. And I feel that we'll see probably the lowest wheat acreage ever, uh, winter wheat acreage ever. So, you know, reality is, you know, we saw it happen. We, we, it's very easy to go from burdensome to feast to famine, so to speak, in wheat. And, and I really am aware, or really kind of conscious that we could see that sort of develop as we move ahead just because of the fact that the, the burdensome global stocks are really sitting in the hands of the Chinese and they're not coming this way. And I don't disagree with any of the fundamental arguments she made and I would even make another positive fundamental argument that wheat export sales are on pace to meet USDA's mm -hmm. export bookings um, projection. However, I think that wheat still has a problem called too much wheat mm -hmm. and we need to keep prices competitive. US prices, it's difficult oh, yeah. for us to compete, yeah. especially against major um, record Russian supplies. So yeah. I'm not as nearly as bullish, or I'm not bullish wheat, but also I think we have the potential to have a rally come out of wheat. But I also think the dryness in the plains could be more of a cattle issue going forward than it will be wheat. Before the break, Naomi, we talked about China. Um, you know, in this week, we, we heard some news that China's actually reducing their tariff on, on cheese. I mean, it yeah. seems like they're really hungry for cheese products. But are they hungry enough for our products? Do you think it makes a difference with this massive cheese supplies that we have on our hands? Yeah, absolutely. They've, they're lowering the tariff, and that's really good news for our export market. For the cheese, and there's um, a cheese surplus here in our country, our demand for cheese, I think, is fantastic and strong and constant, but we need to grow our export markets. And for China to be buying more uh, cheese and other dairy proteins is a really good sign. Their economy is so strong, so right. it'll help our dairy markets, which really need that lift, but it's not gonna make the exports just go leaps and bound higher. It's not gonna pull the milk price up enough with it. But I do think we're in a short-term low where milk mm -hmm. will have a maybe a 50 cent bounce from here, but then trade sideways yeah. in a, the low $15 price range okay. into first quarter because there's so much milk supply okay. out there right now. So you're thinking more sideways trade? Yes. What about uh, when we look at other livestock, when we look at cattle, uh, when we look at hogs? You know, we just have this massive supply and we keep talking about it, but it just keeps growing. But the impressive part about it is demand has been really impressive really good. and better than expected in 2017. And the pace that we're on for exports, we're supposed to see some more growth in beef and pork exports in 2018. And key will be the dollar because compared to a year ago, the dollar is quite weak to, compared to where we were a year ago. And also domestic demand is quite revved up because of the economy. And if we can continue to see economic growth in 2018, demand could keep up with production in 2018 for red meat. You that would be, it could. I think even if gonna, we continue to see these, I mean, these monstrous gains that we continue to see like in the cattle on feed report and things, I mean, you think demand will We'll keep up with that? Yeah, absolutely, because in 2018, we should see about a 4% growth in beef and pork production. And if we can see that little bit of 2 to 3% growth in exports, right. we're going to keep up with it. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be impressive. 
Well, the good news with the growing herd uh, is, is more demand for feed, right? Yes. Right? Yep. And so you look at the flip side of that, mm -hmm. um, really, who do you think benefits from that? Well, corn, of course. I mean, wheat. We have a lot of, of low-protein wheat out there that we need to feed out. Um, you know, we've got a, a lot to see what happens with that low-protein wheat in the southern plains once the VSR is, is basically kind of activated in March uh, in the southern plains there. So that's something to pay attention to. But, you know, any sort of feed grain is, is good. And, and so that increase in livestock supply is, is not a bad thing. But enough to move prices substantially or enough to keep prices where they are considering that the, the, this corn... Uh, production number is, is is more than what we thought. The worst thing that we have going for us right now is the likelihood we're going to see an increase in corn acres. I mean, anhydrous is going on in northern Iowa like it's everyone's job. You know, a lot of guys are, are feeling very confident in what they can do with corn production. And so that's something that, you know, we need that, that significant demand to give us support. The yeah. reality is we're probably going to produce enough. That demand supply. is known. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. It's not a surprise. Real quick, only like 15 seconds. USDA came out with acreage projection, projections yep. this week. 91. What are we 91 million acres for both corn and beans. So pretty much um, both of them are grabbing the acres from wheat. Did yeah. you think soybeans would be higher though? I did. I did because of the cost of production being low, but everybody likes to plant corn. Yep. Thank you very so much. Okay, we need to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're, we'll get their closing thoughts. Unlock the power of ag technology this December in Indianapolis at the first ever ag tech expo. Learn all about it at farmjournalagtech.com. All right, welcome back. Time now for closing thoughts. Angie? Biggest thing I want to say is it may be hard to do something with the old crop stuff in the bin. You, you know, it's rough. But pay attention to what's going on for 2018 production. If you know what you're going to be looking at acreage-wise, you've got beans above 10 bucks, you've got corn above 380. You need to be able to take advantage of some sort of profitable market setup and, okay. and do something with that. All right, Julianne? I see potential for livestock producers to have some profits in 2018 as we move forward. Take advantage of those low feed prices and make sure you're paying attention to that carry in the market because you don't want to extend your coverage too far out. Keep it close at hand. Naomi? Soybeans are at a critical juncture right now on technical charts and fundamentals as well. We're sitting right at the $10 area cruising. If we see a breakout to the upside, it's a dollar higher, yet if South America has a great crop, things could go south quick. So be on your toes with the soybeans. All right, thank you ladies so much. We'll take a quick break and then we'll be back with more on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by QLF. For 40 years, QLF has been proud to support American farmers that feed the world. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Corvus Pre-Emergence Corn Herbicide from Bayer, the only herbicide to offer three levels of defense against weeds, burn down, residual, and activation with rain. Well, we're sticking with the women in ag theme, and John is giving me the floor for a couple minutes this week. Well, as a wife and a mom, I prepare the majority of our meals at our house. Now, I don't mind it one bit. I not only love to cook, but being the one who chooses what meals to prepare as well as the ingredients to use. But my weekly trip to the grocery store is becoming even more complex. I mean, the amount of labels on products is overwhelming and confusing. Raised without antibiotics or antibiotic free, are those even different? I mean, non-GMO versus GMO free, aren't, aren't those the same? I get confused and I consider myself an educated shopper, but I recently heard a speaker talk about a USDA survey. The agency asked consumers the typical questions like, do you want your food labeled if it contains GMOs? Do you want your food labeled if it contains antibiotics? But the survey also asked, do you want your food labeled if it contains DNA? I'll let that soak in. Do you want your food labeled if it contains DNA? Now here's the scary part. More than half said yes. So when having a conversation about the food you produce, you have to understand that the majority of consumers today don't understand the basics of food, let alone a complex topic like genetically modified organisms. And that insight could help shape future conversations about how food is produced. A few weeks ago, I interviewed former Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack. He said when we talk about complex policy issues like NAFTA or even the Farm Bill, we need to start using food as a conduit. So instead of talking about what the Farm Bill means to you as a farmer or rancher, talk about what it means to consumers and food availability as well as affordability. Food has become such an emotional topic for many that sometimes it's the topic of food that creates segregation and controversy, when in reality, no matter where you live, New York or Montana or an urban or a rural area, food is what creates common ground among all of us. So let's make food the topic that bridges us together, not what creates an even bigger divide in the U.S. 
All right, coming up next on U.S. Farm Report, we head out to California where farmers are battling citrus greening. We have that story next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. From the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. We have much more ahead. Tax reform took center stage in Washington this week, but if it's just a temporary fix, there are things farmers can start doing now. Efforts to save California's citrus industry before it's too late. It's a massive ship that had a tragic ending. American Countryside has the story behind an iconic song that captures history. Now for the headlines, fresh off Thanksgiving break, both the House and Senate tackling tax reform this week with a major divide between those in favor of the tax overhaul and those against it. There are still a lot of unanswered questions about tax reform, including if the estate tax will see exemptions doubled or repealed. That's as in addition to the key vote in the Senate this week, the House's version of tax reform is still alive. Farm CPA Paul Neifer says no matter the final changes to the estate tax portion of the bill, those changes will more than likely not be permanent. So I would say, and you know, if we get a change in the White House, a change in Congress, it may not even last 10 years. So if this goes through, I would certainly recommend to farmers in that higher bracket, make some gifts, you know, get, get rid of those assets as quick as you can. As NAFTA talks take a large break, Mexico's Agriculture Sanitation Authority has revoked Monsanto's permit to commercialize genetically modified soybeans in seven states. Monsanto says it's unjustified. The company issuing a statement that the permit had been withdrawn on unwarranted legal and technical grounds. The company says it will take steps to safeguard its rights and those of farmers using the technology. And news from our reporting partners at the Packer, imports continue to represent a rising percentage of fresh fruit consumed in the U.S. If you exclude bananas, imports made up more than 38% of all fresh fruit consumed in the country last year. That's up 1% from 2015, but up 15% from 2010. USDA says this country imports 85% of all the avocados we eat and 12% of fresh oranges. As the opioid crisis sweeps across America, it's impacting farmers more than other rural residents. A new survey backed by American Farm Bureau Federation and National Farmers Union shows nearly three quarters of U.S. farmers and farm workers say they been a directly affected by opioid dependence that compares to the 45% of rural residents as a whole. Stats show about 16% of farmers struggled with addiction. The top challenge cited by young farmers is land access, particularly finding and affording land on the farm income. It is also the main reason why farmers quit farming and why aspiring farmers haven't yet started. This information comes from the National Young Farmers Coalition. The survey collected data from more than 3,500 young and aspiring farmers under 40 years of age. Well, a mainstay of Christmas, the tree itself is under attack from fake trees made in China. The National Christmas Tree Association says the number of artificial trees sold has doubled since 2010. That competition may be putting some U.S. growers out of business. According to the Oregon Department of Agriculture, the number of growers has dropped by 30 percent since 2010. With a shrinking supply of real trees, prices have pushed higher. The NCTA says prices for real trees are 200 percent higher than in 2014. All right, that's it for the news. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman joins us now with a longer range look at weather. Mike, you talked about that frigid front dropping down across the U.S. next week, but how long does it last? Thanks, Tyne. It is quite possible that this uh, blast of cold lasts for several days, if not a few weeks. This is a pattern that might just come and stay for a while. So uh, here's what we're talking about. You can see the trough starting in the west as we head into this week. Then uh, the trough really digs into the northern plains by the middle of the week. This is a direct shot of Arctic air by the end of the week, all the way into the eastern two thirds of the country, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that by Friday as we head into next weekend. That remains. And when you see this kind of as a big bubble here, that's a pattern that can stay for a while, and that's what we'll be watching. So my 30 day outlook for temperatures below normal Mississippi Valley to the east coast. 
above normal for corner region and the west coast. As far as precipitation over the next 30 days, I don't see a lot of big systems, at least initially during the month of uh, December, so we'll go below normal through the southern tier of states near normal farther north. Tyne? Thanks, Mike. Well, as we highlighted during our Harvest of Thanks special, Florida citrus growers were hit hard this year by Hurricane Irma. Florida's lawmakers are requesting federal disaster relief for the state's ag industry as damages from Hurricane Irma climb. Ag Commissioner Adam Putnam sending a letter to the state's congressional delegation asking for aid for the more than $2.5 billion of damage. Yet citrus growers may be hurt the most. Their crop was slashed for a different reason even before Irma made landfall. Betsy Jibben has this week's Farm Journal report. When Hurricane Irma stormed through Florida, it did not discriminate. Crop production losses for the state's citrus growers continue to rise. We, we've been cut in half on a production level because of disease. This cuts that half in half. Florida's citrus crop has been plagued with a disease called citrus greening, spread by an insect called the Asian citrus psyllid, and there's no known cure. USDA is forecasting Florida's orange production at 50 million boxes, which would be 27% less than last year and the lowest since the 1945 through 1946 season. So we got to do some pruning here. Growers like Al Stelly in Escondido, California, hope they're not next. We've taken the attitude of it's not if it comes, it's when. For the first time in decades, California produced 4 million more tons of citrus than Florida during the 2016 through 2017 season. We're producing more oranges in California now than, than Florida, and that's criminal. I'm, well, it's not criminal. I mean, it's sad for Florida, you know, that they've lost that much production to the greening disease. Steli says California growers are just hoping to survive long enough until a cure or treatment is found. Psyllids with the disease have been found in various areas of California, but so far only residential areas. If the disease is here, and it can be in this tree for five years before we know it. He sprays multiple times a year to try to lower the pest population and coordinates with the neighboring groves to spray within a two-week period. That way the psyllid cannot fly from grove to grove. The psyllid is in the new flush, so it would be in this here. No, that's a, not a psyllid. Oh, there's one. It's right there. Now that is nothing to go through this many leaves and only find one. That's just been hatched. Although not all psyllids carry the disease. It's not unlike the relationship between the mosquito and malaria. So if there's no malaria, the mosquito bites you, you don't get malaria. But if the mosquito previously bit somebody with malaria, you're gonna get malaria. So if there's no greening here and that insect is on my trees, it's not going to bring me the disease. Steli is transitioning these trees into organic production. However, he believes a GMO technology may be the only way to combat the disease around the world. Currently, GM citrus is not sold commercially. I think the GMO may be the answer eventually, or some kind of lucky breeding, um, and then you won't have organic citrus. As California growers aim to produce a big crop. Mm, not bad. They are leery and on alert, watching growers on the opposite side of the country for clues to a solution. They thought we did have a better crop that we would maybe uh, start plateauing and maybe increasing. So uh, uh, very optimistic in the industry, but after this, it's, uh, it's really been tough. Reporting for U.S. Farm Report, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Thanks, Betsy. Well, Steely says he's looking into putting in multiple citrus houses around his trees in an effort to keep the insect out. All right, up next, John Phipps. Long-term thinking, it's a good idea. Your call is very important to us. Please hold. Welcome back. Well, it's time now to check in with John Phipps from the farm. John. This week, I want to share a note that made my day when it showed up. Your commentary is a regular staple for me and my dogs at breakfast. The insight on startup farming is very informative, as I believe a good education is expensive no matter how you get it. The School of Hard Knocks is always an option, but not my first choice. 
I have tried small-scale aquaponics and enjoy gardening. My wife's favorite would be a nature sanctuary, but not financially feasible. My point for small-scale startups might be to try Christmas tree farming combined with fruit and nut, or uh, and nut orchards on a portion of the acreage. These may provide a windfall when it is needed most. And that's from Robert Farmer from Harrington, Delaware. Thank you for writing, Robert, and for including your full address. Saves time. Our producers, as well, were glad to know that we are reaching that all-important canine demographic. Your note touches on something I think will be very important for all of Ag in the next few years, and that is thinking long terms. When your day-to-day -day problems are intense and immediate, it is easy to ignore the opportunities we have to make things better or more profitable years or even decades from now. Your suggestions of a tree farm and orchards are such endeavors. While we may be motivated to invest in long-term projects to pay back those who did so to our benefit years ago, my experience is such efforts can renew our commitment to a better future for all of us especially for younger people. I encourage them to Google some life expectancy statistics. Most of us are going to live a lot longer than we think, and those lives will be healthier as well. Projects you think you will not see come to fruition could be big factors in your retirement, not just something you hand down. These investments should not be limited to tangible assets either. Starting or sustaining social assets like professional or fraternal associations, churches or community organizations not only make our futures better, but are powerful tools that can help us get to that future. From time to time, lift your eyes to more distant horizons because you're getting there faster than you think good reminder. Thank you, John. And if you have questions or comments for John, send him a note. That's mailbag at usfarmreport.com. When we come back, we'll relive history as Andrew McCray makes a trip to an historic shipwreck in the Great Lakes. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Delaro. New Delaro fungicide for corn and soybeans can help you get the edge you're looking for to achieve personal best yields. Delaro, keep raising the bar. In the northern U.S., five lakes not only represent the largest freshwater lakes on Earth by area, but the lake's beauty attract tourists each year who are trying to soak up some of the water's precious beauty. But more than 40 years ago, rough waters were enough to consume a massive ship, a story so impactful it was commemorated by a song. Here's Andrew McRae. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down at the big lake they call Gitchagumi. It's a story from Lake Superior that we mostly know from a song by Gordon Lightfoot, but it's also a story about several centuries of boats and their crews navigating the locks and Great Lakes around Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. If we went back to the 1880s, uh, turn of the last century, uh, it would be like a nonstop parade of ship traffic passing. And there's something that you get with all of that extra ship traffic, you get more accidents. The old Weather Bureau building here, next to the Sioux Locks, provided ships with an idea of the weather they might expect on the lakes. There are about 200 shipwrecks along the 80-mile harborless stretch west of Whitefish Point. The Edmund Fitzgerald is one of those. That was November 10th, 1975. It really wasn't that long ago. Uh, here at the Sioux Locks alone, there were 90-mile-per-hour wind gusts that were recorded. And this whole area, the, the street that we're standing near, Portage Avenue, that was completely flooded. Uh, waves were crashing up over the lock gates here. It was just a pretty dramatic day. And in Lake Superior, the Fitzgerald was battling 30-foot waves that November night. What can be a beautiful and peaceful lake that turned to one that could consume a 700-foot long ship? The captain wired in, he had water coming in, and the good ship and crew was in peril. Later that night when his lights went out of sight came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Today there are only theories about what happened. Paul Saverin at the Valley Camp Ship Museum near the Sioux Locks has a few of the only artifacts from the Edmund Fitzgerald. When she sank, there were debris. Two of it were the lifeboats. The lifeboats are inside the museum ship Valley Camp. Both the ship Valley Camp and the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum tell the story of the Fitzgerald and the centuries of navigation that has taken place on these lakes. As for the wreck of the Fitzgerald, 
exploratory subs have examined the site, but for the most part, it remains undisturbed, the resting place for the 29 who perished. It was the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society that in the 80s and early 90s then recovered at the request of the parents the bell from the Edmund Fitzgerald. The ship's bell was replaced with one bearing the names of those 29 sailors. Every November 10th, here at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum, the bell tolls for those who were lost. The church bell chimed till it rang 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. Although decades have passed, the story of the Fitzgerald and the many ships that pass through the Sioux Locks today are a sight that bring visitors from around the world. We may never know the exact reason the Fitzgerald went down in November of 1975, but for freighters like this passing through the Sioux Locks, these waters will always be some of the most important, yet treacherous in the world. Traveling the countryside in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I'm Andrew McCray. To hear more of Andrew's travels, visit AmericanCountryside.com. When we come back, Machinery Repeat has this week's Tractor Tales. Please stay with us. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. Tractor Tales is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? MachineFinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week we're off to central Indiana to learn about a classic John Deere. The 630 was purchased in 1959 and has been in the family ever since. Today, owner Greg Barnes takes us out to the field to show us what this beauty can do. It was my granddad's biggest tractor he ever farmed with. And when he passed away, our family gave it to my brother and I, and we had it redone about 20 years ago, and we've been playing with it ever since. It's a lot of fun. We don't have a farm, but my granddad did, and we, we just come out for plow day, and I plow gardens on the side when people call me and ask me about it. They completely went through everything, painted it, done some motor work to it, and then we just put new tires and rims on it yesterday, actually. I'm pulling a fully mounted three bottom, 314 bottom plow, plowing on cover crop, and it's a little slick out today. Uh, we're just gonna keep it in the family as long as we can and uh, keep playing with it. And we take it to the county fair and things like that. To me, it's real important. It keeps a lot of camaraderie, keeps the young kids involved with the antique part of the tractor. They seem to really enjoy it. Most of them don't know how all this older equipment runs and works. They're used to the newer stuff with an air conditioner. <laughs> Thanks so much. And we want to let you know that Tuesday, December 12th, U.S. Farm Report will be at the Ag Tech Expo in Indianapolis, Indiana. We have a panel set up from 1145 to 1245 focused on not only driving higher yields, but capturing better value for those products. We have four great panelists lined up, so we hope to see you there. Well, stay with us. Next up on the show, we have From the Farm Photos. Shop Machine Repeat Cyber Sale from November 27th to December 4th. Find special reduced price deals on all types of equipment from dealerships across the country. Make a purchase and receive $200 extra holiday cash. Visit www.machinerepeat.com slash sale. Welcome back this weekend. Well, harvest is nearly complete in Minnesota. Lauren sent us this picture. He says it hasn't been an easy fall. It's been very wet, Mike, with a lot of combines getting stuck until it turned cold and then the ground froze. But he says yields are good, close to another record, actually, in his area. In Alexandria, South Dakota, brothers Chris and Andrew were finishing up tilling this week. The last field for 2017. Ah, oh, that last field is always what you <laughs> want to see. And Mike, I had the privilege of traveling to Williamsburg, Virginia Ooh. this week. It's just gorgeous right it now. Is. I mean, with the leaves turning colors, but this weekend is actually their annual illumination event, which will draw up to 50,000 people. Wow. That's a little slice of history, and this year very <laughs> festive with the decorations. We'll have that story uh, Christmas weekend on, on U.S. Farm Report. But before Christmas weekend. Well, that weekend, place is filled with history. So that, it, oh, yeah, my gosh. It's no just, it, it's amazing to see. But coming up this next week. I mean, we're entering into December. You're talking about this cold front and, and it's going to be pretty widespread. Everybody east of the Rockies. Okay, but how short lived? I think it lasts for a while. This is a this is a pattern change that I think comes in and it might last through most of December. 
that's a, that's going out on a limb for me to say so, uh, but I think it's going to last a while anyway. We've had some mild weather, but winter is saying, hey, uh, winter will be here east of the Rockies <laughs> quickly next week. All right, if you have a picture or a video you would like to send, you can do that to the address on the screen. And from all of us at U.S. Farm Report, I'm Mike Hoffman. And I'm Tyne Morgan. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to join us again right here next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.